Amen. Thank you, Truax family. Oh, what a wonder of faith can move the mountains. Miracles happen. Silent prayers get answered. Uh, we could probably all raise our hand to yes to all of those. You know, this morning as we uh, think about uh, becoming more healthy in 2018, uh, we'll be looking at physical health. The, the Lord kind of uh, shifted me in a different direction than I thought and when we first started this series. I thought, well, I'll be talking about kind of uh, how to get literally physically healthy, kind of lose weight and get in shape that way. And, and the only thing I'm going to say today regarding that, and this is just a freebie, eat less, exercise more, and you will eventually lose weight. That's a great slogan, and we're going to look at some slogans this morning, particularly in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as the Apostle Paul is going to be dealing with some popular slogans that were misunderstood or misapplied in his day. And so, but to get us kind of going this morning, maybe, maybe you're still trying to wake up. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you haven't had the second or third cup of coffee that you need, but we're going to be looking at some popular slogans that have been in America since about the first one was 1927. So I'm going to give you the slogan. These are advertising slogans. And if you know it, go ahead and yell it out. This first one, I was impressed. People in the first service actually knew it. I didn't know that this was a, a slogan for this particular company. But if you know the company, if you know the product, just go ahead and yell it out. 1927, the pause that refreshes. There you go, Coca-Cola. I did not know that. They're not really using that too much. We'll come back to another one in just a little bit. But uh, 1930s, the breakfast of champions. 1930s again. And we needed this the last couple weeks. It's been so cold. Mmm, mmm, good. Campbell's soup. 1932, got any cereal eaters in here? Snap, crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. 1934, been around a long time when you care enough to send the very best. Hallmark. 1950, melts in your mouth, not in your hand. M&M's. Now, now, number seven, th this is like the official slogan of Southern Baptist churches everywhere from 1952. Finger licking good. That is the Baptist bird. Unfortunately, I did not have any of that on my fingers, so that didn't work very well. In 1970, this has kind of stuck around a little bit more than the first one. It's the real thing, Coca-Cola. 1975, you don't want to leave home without it. American Express. 1979, you want to reach out and touch someone. AT&T, 1981, be all that you can be, the Army. And then 1984, the year that I graduated high school, so I remember this well, where's the beef? <laughs> Wendy's. You know, I, I love Wendy's, I love all those, but you know, growing up, we, you know, typically in the, in the 70s and early 80s, if you had a, a McDonald's around, you were, you were doing pretty good. But you know, you know yeah, yeah, with your wallet too, but you know, you, you don't remember, some of you young don't remember that in the 1970s, 1980s, probably even into the 1990s, if you went into McDonald's and you wanted to order a hamburger like I did without onions, you couldn't do that. Or it took like 20 or 30 minutes to get a hamburger from McDonald's the way th that you wanted it done. And so I would just go ahead and order the hamburger, and I don't know how many times and how many hamburgers that I scraped off those little teeny onions. And maybe you were pickles or something. It was just you, 1973 came along, and what a great slogan for that particular age the Vietnam War was winding down, the sexual revolution was in full swing, and along came a fast food chain that had a slogan that still sticks in my head today. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask, 
is that you let us have it your way. Have it your way at Burger King. And so I could have it my way at Burger King. But what a fitting slogan that Burger King came out with in 1973 that captured the spirit of the age. Have it your way. For you see, in January of 1973, 45 years ago tomorrow, there was another slogan that was created. Now, I don't know if it was first used 45 years ago on January 22nd, 1973, but it has since entered into the lexicon, into the popular, popular culture of America, and it is simply this. It's my body, and I can do whatever I want with it. And since 1973, over 60 million unborn babies have been aborted in this country. From 1975 until 2013, uh, over 1 million unborn babies have been aborted each year, with 2014 seeing a drop below 1 million. Indeed, the slogan, the philosophy, it's my body and I can do what I want with it, is in direct and polar opposition to the biblical word of God. But make no mistake, that philosophy is not new. That philosophy did not spring in 1973 uh, new. That philosophy has been around all the way since the Garden of Eden, for that philosophy is the philosophy of the enemy, the prince of the darkness, Satan himself. And it's a philosophy that may mask itself in different ways. It's a philosophy that will have different ways that it will come out. But make no mistake, as Solomon says, that there is nothing new under the sun. What is has always been and will be again. And so maybe it's packaged a little differently. And even in 2018, that philosophy that is still alive and well, it's my body. I can do with it what I want. If it doesn't hurt anybody, you can just do it. That philosophy still permeates our culture. And sadly, sometimes it permeates even within the church itself and even among Christians. The Apostle Paul had to deal with that very philosophy back in the first century in the church of Corinth. Corinth, if, if you don't know much about Corinth, Corinth, Corinth was not the, the model church of the first century. Uh, they, they had their problems, they had their issues, that's why Paul had to write not one, uh, but two letters that we actually have in the New Testament. Some scholars say that there's actually a, a third letter and even a, a fourth letter that the Apostle Paul had to write to the Corinthian church. And the question this morning is, how many letters would the Apostle Paul have to write to the church in America today. So folks, this morning, as we think about physical health, it really always begins with spiritual health. It always begins with Jesus. You see, we cannot separate the two. Just as we cannot and should not separate our finances, just as we cannot and should not separate any of our relational health, we simply cannot separate our physical health from our spiritual health, because it begins and ends with Jesus, it always does. It's much more about whether you have the right body mass index. It's much more than whether you have the right blood pressure. It's much more than whether you have the right blood sugar level. It's much more than all of that. It's far deeper and far broader. And so this morning, as we look in First Corinthians chapter 6, we see the Apostle Paul dealing with issues in Corinth that we still deal with today in 2018 when it comes to our overall physical health that is still linked to our spiritual health. So if you have your copy of God's Word this morning and are able to stand, I invite you to stand as we read 1 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 12. And Paul here in your copy of God's Word perhaps has this first portion of Scripture in quotes. Paul is quoting back a slogan that was used in the Corinthian church by Corinthian Christians 
when he says, all things are lawful for me. And indeed, Paul had talked about those things, all things being lawful. Now they're misunderstanding what he said, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And then verse 13, another slogan that was used. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Basically equating food with sex, it's just biological in nature. There's nothing to it. There's nothing beyond just the, the physical act of sex. And so uh, Paul is dealing with that and says God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Father, we thank you this morning that we can glorify you in our body, not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Father, we thank you that we are bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Father, might we remember that this morning, uh, might we know it, and might we live as if we are redeemed. Father, I pray that you'd speak to us through your word. Father, might we hear, and might we not just simply hear, but might we put into practice all that you're calling us to do. Might your spirit encourage us, convict us, and in the case that needs to happen, admonish and rebuke us. And Father, we pray uh, that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, folks, how can we be physically healthy in 2018? Again, we simply cannot disconnect. We cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. Oh, that's what our culture wants us to do. Indeed, that's what many Christians would love to do, at least those who call themselves Christians. We can come on Sunday morning. We can worship for an hour or two. But once we walk out the door, uh, we begin to separate or disconnect from our faith, the faith that can move mountains, even on our way home, or when we get to our home, we can live life radically different than we do on Sunday morning for an hour or two at church. When we get up and we go to work Monday morning, we can live life radically different than we do on Sunday morning. That is not to be the case, because we are to have spirit, mind, body, so all together they simply cannot be disconnected. When we spend money, we simply cannot disconnect it from our spiritual life of being good stewards. Likewise with our physical body, they are all connected. John, who was the last of the apostles to live, uh, tradition says that he died of old age, the only one who did not die a martyr's death. The five books that we have, uh, in the New Testament uh, by this apostle in 3 John, verse 2. He links good health uh, with our spiritual well-being when he says, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. You see, the two simply cannot be divorced. The two simply cannot be dislinked. The two simply cannot be separated. They are together. And so this morning, as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see three things that we need to understand about our physical health. The first is simply this, to understand your body's appetites. Understand your body's appetites. The Apostle Paul was pushing back, not just against food, mind you, he was ultimately pushing back against the se sexual ethic of the day. And the sexual ethic of the day in Corinth was one of this. We can do whatever we want to do. We can even go to the temple prostitutes. And these were including Christians who came out of a pagan background who were now part of the Corinthian church. That's why the Apostle Paul spent so much time, particularly in 1 Corinthians, dealing with this particular issue. It is not a new issue today. It has been an issue since time began. And so don't misunderstand what our appetites are, but rather understand. And indeed, there was a misunderstanding. Uh, for the Corinthian Christians, some of them, uh, they would quote back to the Apostle Paul some of his words. All things are lawful for me. 
meaning we can do whatever we want to do because we're separate. Our body and our spirit is separate, so if we want to have relations with temple prostitutes, we can do that. It will simply not affect our body. The Apostle Paul is pushing back against that ethic of that day to say, no, they're connected. You simply cannot do that. They wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. The Apostle Paul says, all things might be lawful, but for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, simply not all things are beneficial. And particularly if it goes contrary to the Word of God, it is not beneficial 100%. It will never be beneficial. If it contradicts God's Word and God's commandments, And God's ethics, whether it's dealing with sex, whether it's dealing with money, whether it's dealing with relationships, if it goes against God's word, it will never be beneficial for the Christian. We cannot make it beneficial, and our culture cannot make it beneficial for us. It does not matter, even if all of the culture, and folks, we will see this more and more, even if 90% of the culture Even if 90% of folks that you know, maybe even in your family or your place of work, or the government, if everybody went the other way, they are still wrong. We stand upon the inerrant, unchanging word of God. And so it is our standard. And so in Corinth, They were misunderstanding what their appetites were. And the Apostle Paul says, wait a minute, all things are lawful for me. That doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to do. And in fact, they would also quote back the other slogan, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, a popular slogan that seemed to celebrate the idea that sex, like eating, is purely biological, that it had no spiritual or emotional implications. That was wrong-headed then, and it is just as wrong-headed today. For you see, Christians and others who think that they can be a part of the hookup culture, and that they can just go through life unscathed, are sadly mistaken. Young people, and this is not just for you. But I know Pastor John's heart, and I I know where you are, and, and I know where our culture is. It's not just for you, but folks understand that God has designed marriage. God has designed sexuality within marriage, and it is good. But any sex outside of the bounds of marriage between one man and one woman at one time is simply outside of God's biblical standard. And it will never, ever be beneficial to go against what God has called good. Folks, understand, premarital sex, adultery, pornography, homosexuality, anything that goes against God's design for marriage. In the beginning, Paul comes back to this as he talks about being joined with that which is not your wife. It goes all the way back because God designed marriage and God designed sex within the confines of marriage and anything outside of that, no matter what our culture says, no matter what popular magazines and movies and movie stars say, no matter, folks, it will never be beneficial to do that which God says is not beneficial. So don't do it. But how? How do you understand your body's appetites and then try to bring them under control? Because, folks, honestly, we can't on our own. Maybe maybe it's food. I I don't know about you. I I love to eat. You you can tell. I'm a a Baptist pastor. I love to eat. I'm I'm licking my fingers, even when there's no chicken on my fingers. Maybe that's that's your, your struggle. Maybe your struggles with sex and sexuality. Maybe your struggles with, with media and television and social media and video games and all those things. Maybe your struggle is being a workaholic and just working all the time. Maybe your struggle is hobbies. Maybe your struggle is all... 
God knows what your struggle is. He, he just knows what mine is. What mine is may not be yours. What yours is may not be your spouse's, may not be the person sitting beside you or behind you. But if we were honest with ourselves, every single one of us struggles. Oh, we may not struggle like we did early on, but there's every, every single one of us struggles with something. The enemy knows because the enemy, Satan, loves to take that which is good and what God created good and to use it for sinful purposes. And why Satan is not omniscient and he's not omnipresent, he knows our playbook. He knows your playbook. He, he knows what our weaknesses are. He, he knows if we're going to run left or run right. And folks, he... When it comes to the opponent, Tom Brady is not the goat. The greatest of all time opponent that we have is Satan himself. Amen. And he will trip you and me up every single time. Understand what your appetites are. Because when we begin to understand what our appetites are, when we begin to understand what our weaknesses are, then we can do what God has called us to do, and indeed what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians, and that's to submit your body to Christ. He writes, do you not know that your body, what is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, precious gift, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Folks, it's not my way. It's his way. It's not about what I can do. It's about what he has already done and what he continues to do in us. It's not about I can do anything I want with no consequences. It's I am now a slave of Jesus Christ bought with a price. But folks, it's not just about Christians. Understand, we are to submit to God, each and every one of us, no matter whether we're a believer or not, even if we don't even think we should. Why? Because God is the creator God, and he is the one who has created each and every one of us. He's knit us together in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139. And whether folks understand it or not, whether they believe it as truth or not, it is still nevertheless true that God is the creator God, and none of us has come into existence just poof, by accident. Adam and Eve did not just suddenly, uh, miraculously evolve from the goo and the primordial zoo. God spoke them into existence, and they became life. And from then on, God is the one who is the creator God. And whether you believe it or not, one day, every knee, not just the knees of believers, one day, every knee, will bow. And one day every tongue, not just the tongue of believers now, but every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For he is the creator God, God the Father who creates. We submit to him as the creator God. Uh, but if you're a believer this morning, uh, we submit our bodies to Christ because we've been redeemed by God the Son. We are not our own. It directly contradicts the philosophy of of this age. We have been bought with a price. And what is the price? It is the price of Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Calvary, not for his sins, but for your sins and for my sins and the sins of the world. Talk about a price that has been paid. It's not insignificant. It is not small, but it is the price of Almighty God coming to this earth that he might go to the cross of Calvary and there die on the cross for sinners like us, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed. How I love to proclaim it. Redeemed. And forever I am. If you're redeemed this morning, if you know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord, you've been bought with a price that you could never pay, but that the Son of God did for you and for me. Paul puts it in Romans chapter 14, verses 8 and 9, this way. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's, not our own. We are His. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that He might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Folks, if you've been redeemed by Jesus Christ, your body is simply not your own anymore. It is His, lock, stock, and barrel. And we simply cannot give in to the spirit of the age which says, I can do it my way, or I can do whatever I want with my body because it's my, no, it's redeemed. It's been bought back. It's been paid for in full by Jesus Christ and his precious blood on the cross of Calvary. You say, Pastor, I, I know that. I can't possibly, how can I possibly overcome the appetites? How can I possibly overcome the struggles that I have? How can I, you can't, but he can. 
Because praise God, when you were redeemed, when you've been born again, you're immediately, not later on, not some kind of second blessing, but you are immediately indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God. So that the God who spoke the world and the universe into existence, the God who is upholding this whole world and universe even by his own power this morning, that same God whose power rose Jesus Christ up from the dead, lives in you and in me. That's good news. I, I don't know about you. That, that's fantastic because we can't do it. We have no power. We've got absolutely no ability apart from the Holy Spirit of God. As Pastor John shared this morning in the first service, as they went over to the Youth Evangelism Conference, they, they were fearless in the, the verse, uh, it, you know, God's not given us a spirit of, of fear or timidity, uh, but of power and love and of self-control, a sound mind, of self-discipline. Folks, if you're born again, then you have Almighty God who has indwelled you and taken up residence in your life. Why? Because Jesus said it, and what Jesus says and what he promises, he will fulfill. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, he says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you most of the time. Now that, what's the word? How do we live? We live part-time. We live as if maybe, maybe not. He will send another helper to be with you forever, all the time. And where will he be? Just kind of out here? Just kind of like, well, maybe, maybe he'll show up. Maybe he won't show up. I don't know where he's going to be. Well, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. What does that mean? You can't get very far away from God, can you? Now, we might walk away from him we might not walk in his spirit we might walk in the flesh we, we might walk in doing things that we want to do but when we're born again the holy spirit of god the third person of the trinity comes and takes up residence in our life forever and he'll never leave us nor forsake us and he will be with us every day in the struggles of life because he is faithful, and he is almighty God. I don't know what area of life that you're struggling, what area of life that you need to submit to the Lord this morning. Maybe it's your eating. Maybe you're overeating. Maybe, I, you know, I, I got to watch what I eat or else I, I become a glutton. I just, I mean, I, I, I'm, anybody a comfort food to eat? I mean, I just... You know, you just give me some Stouffer's mac macaroni and cheese, and man, I'll, I'm there. M maybe it's that. May maybe it's sexuality and sexual ethics. Maybe it's premarital sex. Maybe you're dealing with, uh, struggling with homosexuality. Maybe you're struggling with, with adultery. Maybe you're struggling with pornography. I, I don't know what the struggle is. God knows what your struggle is. Amen. Maybe you're struggling with, with substance abuse. Maybe you're struggling with alcohol abuse, drug abuse. And by the way, it doesn't matter whether that's legal or not. It doesn't matter what the government says. The government says abortion is legal, but we know that's against God's law. It doesn't matter whether it's, maybe it's prescription drugs. It, it doesn't matter. Maybe you're abusing, abusing those things in your body. Maybe, maybe you're abusing your, your body because you're just working so hard and, and you're not getting enough sleep. I, I don't know what the struggle is with you. God knows what your struggle is right now. I, I don't have to know. He knows. He says, let, let me help you. I will send another helper. Just, Lord, I, I can't do this on my own. We never have been able to. We never can. That's why we have the helper. That's why we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us forever. Ask for his help. Because only then, when we submit our body to the Lord, Will we truly be able to do what Paul 
tells the Corinthians and what the Lord tells us at the end of verse 20. So glorify God in your body. And what does it mean to glorify God in your body? Simply this, to honor God as holy and righteous in everything that we do say and think. Not by our own standards, not by the world's standards, but by the standards that he has already given us to go on the unchanging, eternal, inerrant word of God. And so as Paul reminds the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so whether you eat or drink, or here's that word that as, as a former attorney, I just really wish wasn't here because this really expands it and doesn't allow for many loopholes or whatever you do. It's whatever. It's whatever. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Folks, this morning, God is calling us to glorify Him individually and as a body. For you see, we are part of the body of Christ at Ramoth Baptist Church. And what one does affects the rest. Don't make the mistake that well, I, what I do won't really matter to the rest. We're all part of the body. What one does, for good or for bad, affects the rest of the body. Oh, our culture will continue to increase the slogans, will continue to say, whatever feels good, just do it. It's my body, I can do with it whatever I want. For the Christian, for the follower of Christ, that can never be our ethic. That can never be our marching orders. For when we leave this place, after gathering for worship, wherever our feet might take us, we understand that our body is not our own. We have been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have been given not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, the Holy Spirit power of love and of self-control and a sound mind. Despite what our culture says, might we today, might we this week, wherever our feet might take us, glorify God in our bodies to his glory, everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you this morning for Jesus Christ who was willing to come and to die on the cross of Calvary to shed his blood, that we might be redeemed, that we might be bought back from the slave market market of sin, of, of Satan, and of death itself. And Father, might we never use our freedom for license. Might we never use our liberty for sin. But might we understand the struggles, the appetites that we have. Maybe good, but Satan is using it for sin. And Father, as we do understand, might we submit our life to you and ultimately, the power that lives inside of us as believers, we do not do this alone. We do it together. We do not do this alone. We do it with you, the helper that you have sent, the Holy Spirit of God who has taken up residence in our life so that wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we say, whatever we think, the Holy Spirit is going with us. Might this week others see Jesus in and through us. And Father, might we be submissive and might we ultimately glorify you in all that we do. Whatever it is this morning that we need to surrender to you. Maybe we've surrendered it before and we picked it back up and we've surrendered it again and we picked it back up. We've done that time and time again. Today is a new day. And God is a merciful and gracious God. And perhaps today, at this moment, you simply, before you leave, need to surrender that struggle to the Lord today and leave it at the cross, covered by the blood. Father God, I pray this morning that we would surrender to you every area of our life, whatever it is, we would submit to you and we would glorify you in our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen.